Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Kerwin, and on today's show, I've got Dr. James Nicolantonio. Dr. James Nicolantonio is a doctor of pharmacy, a cardiovascular research scientist, and he's also an associate editor of the BMJ Open Heart Journal. Not only that, he has also authored and co-authored approximately 200 publications in medical literature. So, James, I think we can safely say you've done a lot of reading in your time about uh, medical research. Yeah, I love to read and I love to research. So it's, uh, it's one of my passions. Yeah. So we're going to get into one of your big passions, which is your book, which I've got here, which the people watching on YouTube can see, The Salt Fix. And I finished the book now and I'm saying, wow, the, the book really has opened my eyes to the issue around salt and health. And I, I knew I should be getting more salt because it's good for us, but I didn't realize how much more actually is good for me. So I wanted to know if maybe we could start off. Um, why has salt been perceived as so bad for us in our health? Yeah, it's a great question. It was really the first question I wanted to answer when I was writing my book is where did the low salt device even come from? And basically what ended up happening is the same nutritional whiplash that we're now dealing with cholesterol. Now all of a sudden cholesterol is no longer you know, apparently not a dietary demon anymore is because the 1977 dietary goals came out with six recommendations for all Americans. And that's basically when we demonize salt, cholesterol, fat, saturated fat, and we were told to eat a high carb diet. And all of that was just strictly based on opinion, wasn't based on fact. And that 1977 dietary goals became the 1980 dietary guidelines. And that low salt dogma has just been updated every five years. And no one asked to say, did we even have any evidence to demonize salt in the first place? And we never did. Yeah. And that's what just blew my mind when you, because you, you did such a great job of taking us through the history of salt from the first hypotheses of salt and blood volume and creating blood pressure issues and all the way into the late 70s when that that's really i don't want to i don't know if it's the right word to say if it's too harsh but it's kind of feels like fraud in a way because the science was so weak yet they did a population change on dietary guidelines and it and it did it happened in those late 70s even with the cholesterol issue so it was a bad time for diets i think in that time and the advice that they were giving yeah no uh, you're 100 percent right yeah so um do you feel then that um we've kind of been sold a bit of a dummy when it comes by the dietary guidelines when it comes to what we should be eating and how much salt we should be taking in yeah that's definitely something that i think it has happened so basically what ends up happening with the dietary guidelines is it the recommendations are basically from a committee, right? So there's this um, there's this committee that they assemble and they get these opinions. And if they choose to ignore a certain meta analysis, somehow they can get away with that. And so it's not these guidelines are not always based on the best evidence that's out there. And so when when people can start to understand that there's not a single clinical study that has ever proven that cutting salt intake is going to reduce cardiovascular events or premature death. You can start to then understand why we are in this state of nutritional whiplash because we're basing a lot of our guidelines on opinions and not facts. Yeah. And that's incredible to think guidelines as strong as that. And that that message is so strong to say how deadly or the it comes across as like it's, it's, it's deadly for, for you if you have too much salt. And as you said, the, the science behind it, where there's, there haven't been robust studies to show that, yeah, people are dropping like flies if they take too much salt, um, is I think hopefully that's quite enlightening to people to realize like, no, peop, you know, they aren't finding people just dropping dead because they've, they're having too much salt. And I think, I don't know if I've got this right, but when I was reading, was the initial sort of evidence only based on 200 people and it, was, it wasn't even strong evidence uh, on those 200? Yeah, basically, they only had evidence in 200 hypertensive patients. So they extrapolated those blood pressure lowering benefits to the entire population, even though they never looked at any of the harms that happen when you cut your salt intake. So even if blood pressure is lowered, heart rate almost always goes up. And so that tells you that the reduction in blood pressure is generally due to volume depletion, which is not necessarily a good thing. So even the one surrogate marker that the low salt um, 
advocates can hang their hat on supposedly, even starts to disintegrate when you start actually looking at what is even going on with this reduction in blood pressure. And generally, it's a reduction in blood volume. Mm. And as you as you take take us through in the book, um, that heart rate one is a biggie, and how that was. There was one particular study where they did. I think was it Intersalt where they actually excluded it, even though they had the data on it. So yep. again, that's you know kind of talk about putting a bad taste in your mouth, thinking why are you hiding scientific data like that? So it's not very open. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So then. I think that that's a great cue on to one of my next questions here about the difference between our intake of salt just for basic survival versus intake of salt for thriving. And this, that's quite a massive difference. Yeah, that's a great, um, great point because we've kind of confused the two. Uh, a lot of the low salt advocates kind of hang their hat on, well, we only need about 300 milligrams of sodium to live each day. And we know that every essential nutrient has a basically you can get too little of it, you can get an optimal amount and you can get too much. And why would we strive to get the minimal amount to live? Why wouldn't we strive for the optimal amount? Mm -hmm. And so in in my book, I kind of discuss how the, that optimal amount seems to be about one and a third teaspoons of salt to about two and two thirds teaspoons of salt. And yet we're told to consume less than one teaspoon of salt per day. Um, and so really, you can start to understand what the optimal amount is when you start to see at what intake level of sodium does all the stress hormones begin to elevate? And so when you start cutting sodium to less than 3,000 milligrams a day, renin, angiotensin 2, and aldosterone all skyrocket. And we block those hormones with medications to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events and mortality. So it never made much sense that let's only look at blood pressure and let's not look at all the you know, artery stiffening hormones that are elevated and not to mention the stress hormones, noradrenaline and adrenaline, adrenaline are also activated with low salt diets. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I actually want to talk a bit more about salt and stress because I believe that's a massive one in our modern society. Um, and it's underestimated about that sort of, I don't know if you believe in maybe adrenal fatigue or adrenal insufficiency, but how people are hammering their adrenal glands. Um, and, and then they're hammering them even more by trying to stay healthy by minimizing their salt intake. So it becomes yeah, no, a vicious cycle. It's a really good point. So they're the adrenals, the thyroid and salt are all basically interconnected. So when you cut your salt intake, um, in animal studies, the adrenal glands, um, they hypertrophy because they're constantly spitting out so much aldosterone. So after a while, they just kind of burn out. So there, there is a medical condition called adrenal insufficiency. A lot of people just term it adrenal fatigue, but it is a real, a, a real thing. And what ends up happening with low salt is you're chronically pumping out noradrenaline and adrenaline, and you can burn out basically your sympathetic nervous system. So in a crisis, when you actually need now noradrenaline and adrenaline to help you survive, there, you're, the receptors and the cells are much less sensitive, and, and you can't excrete as much during that acute event because you've just burned the system out. So it can definitely potentially lead to adrenal insufficiency. And when you salt is one of our best ways to get iodine, especially if if you're obtaining a, a salt that naturally contains iodine. And so when you when you follow this low salt advice, you're potentially increasing your risk of iodine deficiency. And obviously we know iodine makes up our thyroid hormones. So you cut the salt, you can actually that can lead to hypothyroidism, that can lead to a reduced metabolism, and potentially you're storing now more fat on a low salt diet. And not not to mention that low salt diets elevate insulin levels and cause insulin resistance. So low salt can literally cause and potentially be leading to prediabetes, diabetes, and obesity. And it's something that most people have never thought of. They've always demonized sugar, which obviously is terrible for you, but also not getting enough of the other white crystal can potentially lead to some of the same harmful effects as over-consuming sugar, which is something I go over in the book as well yeah when you when you help people um realize which white crystal we actually should be getting more of i thought that was a great point so yeah so um what just to help visualize if we go back to um just our basic guidelines again just to cover that because i found reading your book um is interchanging between the term sodium and salt because so so when you're talking about sodium um levels, it's not always equating to salt levels, is it? They're two so, different, 
So like your gram levels, are we, we're talking that sodium could be say 3000, but that from a salt perspective, if someone had to have Correct. like teaspoons of salt, it's more grams, is it? Yeah, you got to multiply the sodium by 2.5 to get the salt. Oh, that's a good formula. So Yep, it's an easy, quick, dirty formula. Um, but basically salt is composed of sodium and chloride and both of those are essential micronutrients. And a lot of people don't realize that the other part of salt, which is chloride, is very important. Like we wouldn't have hydrochloric acid, which is literally hydrogen and chloride to digest our food and to absorb minerals and to prevent bacterial overgrowth without salt. And so in the elderly, um, hypochlorhydria, which is like low acid levels in the stomach is actually a big issue. And that can be potentially leading to a, a lot of a lot of problems. So we, we demonize chloride, like everyone's so afraid of chloride too. And yet it's Chloride and sodium are the two minerals that are in highest concentration in your blood. It's like we are literally like walking oceans. We are salty people. And so to fear and uh, two essential minerals that make up salt just never made much sense, sense to me. Mm. So um, what – And you, I guess we're going to move on here um, then maybe into the salt thermostat and that everyone's salt levels um, – are different, are they? That everyone's sort of needs might fluctuate. So some people might need a bit more salt, some people not so much. Um, is that the case? Yeah, that's 100% correct. So basically your body controls your salt intake. And that's one of the um, dogmas that I was trying to bust in the book is that everybody fears their cravings for salt. They think it's a mild addiction, kind of like cravings for sugar, but they're completely different. So the salt taste receptors will flip on the tongue if you get too much, and that's a built-in safety mechanism. And it would make sense that your body would have these mechanisms for an essential mineral, whereas cravings for sugar, because sugar isn't essential to our body, our body hasn't evolved over 100 million years to control sugar intake and sugar levels. And when I say sugar, I'm talking about glucose and fructose. And so the cravings for salt are absolutely controlled by the body. And so you have these osmoreceptors in the brain and you have receptors in your carotid arteries that are controlling blood volume and salt levels. And basically your body knows if you if it has damage to the intestine and you're someone who's not absorbing salt well and so it'll drive you to consume more so you don't so you literally don't end up dying from salt depletion and there was actually a case report in JAMA like published i think it was like 1930s they this there was a, a there was like a toddler who was always consuming so much salt like he was just raiding his parents' cupboards and they could never get him to stop eating salt they actually strapped this poor kid down in a hospital and he ended up dying with salt depletion because he had salt wasting kidney disease. And that's just like a huge example of like we fear salt so much we we're willing to basically kill a child over it. Like like we they obviously didn't realize that the that this child had like salt wasting kidney disease, but that just goes to show you that our bodies understand if they're becoming depleted in salt and you should listen to those salt cravings. Mm. So I, I always like to think um with nutrients or chemicals, as you mentioned earlier, that you can have a deficiency too little, but also too much. But can you overdose in salt? Do you get that situation by, I'm thinking more by diet, not intravenous wise, but have, are there cases where people are, they, they eat, just go that far, they can kill themselves by eating that much salt? I honestly have never seen anything that would ever indicate that. And just to give you an example of why that's probably not never going to be the case, right? Is one for the last 8,000 years, we've consumed a much higher salt diet than we do today because we never had refrigerators to preserve our food. So everything was laced with salt. So even in Sweden, estimates in the 1600s show that they consumed on average about up to 100 grams of salt per day. And we only consume about eight grams. So it goes to show you how much salt a human being can handle. And so there's been studies that have tested your exact question. How much salt can our kidneys actually handle? And if we are a, a healthy patient population, they've given um, up to 86 grams of salt completely just comes right out in the kidneys. No issues. I mean, I'm sure they could have kept going higher and higher. So honestly, to overconsume salt, unless you have some crazy kidney issue, where you're somehow unable to excrete salt. And people don't understand that most kidney issues cause damage to your ability to reabsorb salt. Most kidney issues, you're actually losing salt in via the kidneys. Because so polycystic kidney disease is an example, glomerulonephritis, pyelonephritis, 
um, tubular interstitial nephritis, which can actually be caused by overconsuming too much sugar, can actually lead to salt depletion from the kidney. So there's very few cases where you would be able to overconsume salt where it would actually just just slowly accumulate and lead to your death. And it, what's funny is this hypernatremia, which is way less prevalent than hyponatremia, is associated with a much less higher risk of mortality versus hyponatremia, which goes to show you again that we should be worrying about low sodium in the blood much more than high sodium in the blood because it's very rare and the consequences of high sodium in the blood are much less than low sodium levels in the blood. Yeah. So maybe that I think sometimes the general population might realize that, yeah, you don't have people rushing through A&E or emergency departments because they've eaten too much salt. Um, but right. you would definitely see people who are so low in salt and they've been admitted because they've fallen over because they're dizzy or there's been a symptom of being so low in salt. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So up to up to 42% of people in the emergency room are coming in with low sodium levels in the blood. And most of them are actually, if it's the emergency room, are due to gastrointestinal losses. Whether someone has had a really bad bout of diarrhea, whether someone has Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or celiacs, they have damage to their intestine, there's wasting a bunch of salt. It's a, it's a very common issue. Mm. So I love it, just the idea that we eat we've been told to take salt out our diet because it can create blood pressure, well, supposed blood pressure issues. and that, But it always comes back to, again, that, um, yeah, it's the, our kidneys are, are, are able to excrete the salt. But then do the salt, low salt advocates say, no, but if you have too much salt, it raises your blood pressure, which damages your kidneys because that's one of the biggest damages of kidneys. And then that creates a, a problem. But we're not seeing that cycle. Right. In fact, like in the book, I say that actually eating a high salt diet can be a relief on the kidneys because 60% of their work every day is reabsorbing the three and a half pounds of salt they filter. So it's an, it requires ATP, a tremendous amount of energy. It's 60 to 70% of the basal metabolic rate of the kidneys is simply just reabsorbing all the salt that they're filtering. So it, they can let more salt just pass freely and not have to reabsorb it if you're eating more salt. What's interesting too, though, is even if someone has a specific kidney issue where they're not losing salt and they're somehow retaining it. The body's really smart. The body can shunt salt in all different places. It can like safely shunt it into the skin. It can actually put it into organs where it's not even need, it doesn't even need to bind to water. So it won't even cause water retention, which is a common myth. So, so your body has all these cool like safety mechanisms with salt. It'll even down regulate the absorption of salt if you're accumulating too much in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. So, so your body has all these safety mechanisms when it comes to salt. Mm. I, when I when I read that point in your book, I kind of imagined us as like storage silos, and so there's so many people whose whose storage units are so low, it's just enough to you know to allow the the unit to keep functioning. But it, we don't have the issue where you fill up the storage unit, but it's fine because once you fill it up, the, it's very efficient at just uh, letting it go. But I'd rather have a full storage unit than the, a storage unit that's in crisis mode all the time. Yeah, that's such a great way to put it. And basically, if your storage unit is more full, right, all the stress hormones can go down and they can just, like you said, freely pass extra salt out of the body rather than having to actively try to retain more salt, which is a much more higher energy suck on your body. Yeah. And I, I'm always looking at ways that we can um, help our body with energy wise um, in, in multiple means. And that's why I loved your book so much because Wow, what a basic biohack. You know, if you want to improve your life, just make sure you get enough salt in your life because you could potentially be giving yourself so much more just natural energy that your cells actually need. And because a, a, a sort of um, a famous, oh, I don't know if it is maybe famous, but a way of helping if yourself if you've got that adrenal, adrenal fatigue issue is taking a salty drink first thing in the morning. Have you come across that technique? Uh yeah, no, absolutely. So basically, um, especially with a lot of people who have sleep apnea and they don't realize it, they lose a ton of salt at night. And the reason is, is because the, the constant episodes where they stop breathing causes central blood pressure to increase 
and that signals natriuresis. So they lose a ton of salt in the morning. There's 20, there's about 20 million Americans who have sleep apnea that, that are not diagnosed. And so they're so, they're, they're, they're so thirsty for salt in the morning and it's like replenishing everything that's been lost at night. So there are, that is actually a big issue in undiagnosed sleep apnea, but no, definitely uh, a lot of people, they, they'll use like Himalayan salt and water and they say it's so refreshing. It like rejuvenates them. And honestly, one of the best ways to boost your energy is to stop restricting salt intake. And, and one of the reasons, not only will your heart rate go down, and so th- some people, they can, they can actually have 10 beats per minute less. So your heart's not just constantly pumping out like at such a rapid rate. And that's so great, right? Like if we can lower our heart rates, that can potentially even extend our lives because some people actually believe that we have a set amount of, you know, heartbeats mm. for our life. And if we can lower our heart rate, that potentially could, you know, extend our lives. And salt is one of the best ways to do that. But what's really cool about salt is if you cut your salt intake to what all the guidelines actually tell you to do, which is less than 2,300 milligrams, even if you hit the very high end of it, there was one study where patients consumed 2,200 milligrams of sodium and they were exercising about a half hour to an hour a day and they were in negative sodium balance. So the, they said the body was pulling sodium from the bone to maintain normal blood sodium levels. But the osteoclasts, they're not smart enough to say, I'm only going to pull sodium. They were also pulling magnesium and calcium from the bone on the low salt diet. And so you are slowly becoming depleted in magnesium, which is required to activate ATP. So that's how low salt diets can potentially lead to a reduction in energy because not only do you lose magnesium from bone, but you also increase aldosterone levels, which which cause you to lose more magnesium out the urine and you also sweat more magnesium out. So the body will actually reduce salt levels in your sweat to compensate for the low sodium intake and they'll push out more magnesium. So like low salt is like a triple threat on your magnesium status. And most people don't realize that ATP is not activated unless it's bound to magnesium. So ATP is really magnesium ATP, and that's your energy. So low salt equals low magnesium, which equals low energy. Mm. Yeah, and I love that point because um, I I recommend magnesium uh, to lift energy levels, but more like say headache uh, people, people suffering migraines, headaches, um, they respond so well. To magnesium because it improves muscle function but i've never really thought about also uh, asking are you making sure you get enough salt because you, again it's this it's the foundation nutrient make sure you have enough salt so if you do take a magnesium supplement i can only imagine it amplifies the magnesium supplement because uh, you've got enough of the salt foundation there yeah, it's kind of crazy how like not getting enough of one nutrient like salt can cause your body to start stripping itself and excreting more of another nutrient. So when I learned that, that honestly was a really eye-opening um, learning experience for me when I when I came across that. Um, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. So it, again, just to highlight that point, if you don't have enough salt, your body is actually going to start harvest, harvesting itself for that salt. And you don't want that. You want to fill that that silo unit again. You want to get your storage units up. Um, so then it's a good idea that for people to have salt to reduce stress. And again, coming back to modern society and just basic um, thinking that, yeah, so many people are under chronic stress for whatever reason. But then that what this is the part I really enjoy because I, I love coffee and I drink a lot of coffee. And I never put the two together that if I'm a coffee drinker, I should actually be intaking more salt. I've never ever heard people sit, sort of put those two points together saying, do you drink lots of coffee? Yes. Okay. Make sure you actually get more salt because you're losing a lot of salt through coffee, for example. Yeah, no, like that was probably one of the most relevant facts that I found for when I was researching the book is that caffeine basically is a huge, it just flushes out your kidneys of sodium and actually even more chloride. And so you can, the typical person is going to lose between a half of a teaspoon to an entire teaspoon of salt by consuming just four cups of coffee. So if you, if you, and if you're consuming more than that, you can imagine how, if you're eating less than one teaspoon of salt, how you can quickly become depleted in it. Mm. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's become a habit now (laughs) since I've read your book. If I'm going to have my coffee, which I love anyway, I I take um, half a teaspoon of uh, salt and I mix it in some water. So I chug that down. So 
I'm get I'm getting the hydration with my salts, and then I can I can have some coffee too. So it, I, yeah. and I just thought that's such an awesome biohack. I think so many people should be doing that. When you have some salt source while you have your coffee, and all that. Yeah especially in the workplace where people are stressed. And then you mentioned it in the book about the cycle that people search for hung, uh, for uh, energy and carbohydrates, but they're searching for caffeine as a quick fix and an uplift. But then it's like you're feeding the negative cycle of you, you're taking all the caffeine, you're on a low salt diet and you just, you, you, you know, when you're winding yourself down and creating adrenal issues and just panic in your body. Yeah, no, that's a great point. You're just, you're constantly taking caffeine, you're boosting your sympathetic nervous system, you're cutting salt even more, which is further activating the sympathetic nervous system and burning out that system. And you're continuously just depleting yourself of salt, you're not using the salt, you're becoming deficient in magnesium and even potentially calcium at the same time. And like you said, it's, it's this like, cycle that is just leading you to consume more coffee because you're slowly depleting your energy levels and you need more and more of that caffeine just to stay awake yeah so no that 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 for me tea and coffee and i i'm in the uk and tea is massive too so it's not only coffee that's this issue but people who drink a lot of tea too yep and that and that would bring me into a point of even the elderly so so many people, like I, as a student, I worked in nursing homes and all elderly people get fed is just cups of tea and biscuits. And I just thinking about that now, you've got a, a population base who are susceptible because they've probably been fed a low, low salt diet because they've been, you know, for cardiovascular reasons, potentially. Well, that's what they were told. But then they're trying to be hydrated with cups of tea, which is depleting them more. And then they've been fed with sugar on top of that. That's Honestly, that's a great point. So, and, and what actually can prove what you're saying is true is nursing home patients, more than 50% of people in nursing homes will have at least one episode of low sodium levels in their blood every single year. So actually hyponatremia is 43 times more prevalent in nursing home patients than the general population. It is a huge issue. And as you say, part of that might be due to the, they're just being fed low salt diets. They're elderly, so they're already at more a, a greater risk. And they're being, like you said, they're giving a uh, tea or coffee and they're potentially losing salt out the urine. So that that's a great point that you brought up. Yeah. So I could imagine if anyone sort of did a research study, if they just went to a nursing home and changed the diets where they said just salt as needs and, you know, make sure that, uh, the, especially if you've got the patient on five, five cups of tea a day and, uh, you know, cut out the biscuits and uh, just give them enough salt. And you, I think you could see a cognitive change in that population base. So you might see heart rates as a good bi, um, biometric variable, but just the, the ability of those patients to maybe communicate and come back and be able to talk more efficiently or move more efficiently. No, that's such a great point. So what's what most people don't realize too is that sodium has so many functions in the body. Like sodium allows so many um so many substances to come in and out of the cell. And actually sodium allows vitamin C to get into the brain. And so literally you can see that the, in these elderly patients what we consider as kind of mild hyponatremia can potentially be leading to these cognitive declines and their disturbances in their gait and falling and fractures because actually sodium is brings vitamin C into the bone as well, which is extremely important for collagen, right? And, and bone strength. So you can start to see how some of the things we've blamed on salt, we blame, we we're crazy. Like we blame salt on causing osteoporosis in, in kidney stones because it may increase the excretion of, of calcium out the urine, but sodium is required to bring in vitamin C into the brain and the bone. And so it's actually important for cognitive function and bone and bone health. And what's funny is, is sodium actually allows us to absorb calcium better. So you may lose a little bit more in the urine, but you're absorbing more in the in the intestines. So it kind of balances itself out. Yeah. So I guess any women who are concerned about osteoporosis or osteopenia, so bone weakening diseases, um, they, as again, as a basic thing, the question would be, are you getting enough salt in your diet? Because you, you, you need that foundation. Yep. And, and it comes back to low salt diets can potentially lead to negative magnesium and calcium balance. And we know that, that magnesium and calcium are extremely important for bone health. So that's just another mechanism how low salt diets can potentially lead to osteoporosis and weakening bones. Yeah. And uh, I'm 
When we looked at the, any negative effects of salt, because I think ho- hopefully people are getting the point now that, yeah, you need salt. There's going to be a lot of negatives compared to the, to let's call it what is perceived as the positive, which is a drop in blood pressure. But the drop in blood pressure is so minimal, isn't it? We're talking like a couple of millimolar in, in the systolic, which is the big number that people would get from their doctor, the, the first number. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So I like to break it down into people with normal blood pressure, pre-hypertensives, and then people who have high blood pressure. So in people who have normal blood pressure, 80% of them are not going to have any type of blood pressure reduction with salt restriction. And what most people don't have never heard about is these reverse responders. So 15% of people with normal blood pressure will actually have a dramatic increase in their blood pressure when they cut the salt intake due to the activation of renin, aldosterone, and angiotensin 2. And about 18% will have a significant reduction in blood pressure. But they're all going to have an increase in heart rate. So if you look at people with normal blood pressure and you look at blood pressure and heart rate, over 80% of them are actually going to be harmed by this advice. And when you look at prehypertensive patients, up to 41% of them can actually have an increase in blood pressure when they cut their salt intake. And so in, in, this, in the same thing with hypertensives, up to uh, 37% of people with hypertension, you, you just never hear about this, will actually get an increase in blood pressure when they restrict their salt intake. Now, there are certain people who will have a good a, a reduction in blood pressure, but that is the minority. Mm. And when we're talking about a good reduction, it's, it's not, we're not talking about going from a very high number of, say, 150 and dropping down to 120 just because they dropped their salt intake, are we? No, no, exactly. So in, in people with normal blood pressure, you may move the needle from, let's say, 120 systolic to 119. That's like, <laughs> that's what, it's ridiculous. I know, sorry, I have to laugh at that because one millimolar of, of pressure is just, you know, if you do a 24-hour blood pressure graph and you see how much your blood pressure moves in a day, and for someone to say, basically harm your body by trying to restrict this nutrient and you might get one millimolar improvement is just insane and that's why i come back to like we got sold such a dummy with those guidelines if you look at the information you share yeah and it's like you're trading that one millimolar reduction in blood pressure for a four beat per minute increase in heart rate makes absolutely no sense yeah and it you know when i read that and you mentioned cholesterol earlier it's it's like the research when you look in cholesterol and sort of the misinformation when it comes to relative risk and absolute risk and the, the amplification of the benef- of the potential benefits. And to say, yeah, you know, reduce your salt intake dramatically and, and, and give yourself a fear response about salt for maybe one millimolar of improvement in your systolic is just, it's ludicrous. And that's why I, I'm, I actually use that example when I talk to people now, like, what do you, and as soon as I say it's only one millimolar, they're like, so why am I reducing my salt intake again? <laughs> exactly. I know, it is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we talked about the salt thermostats, um, and that we can't overdose. Um, we've talked about other common ways of wasting salt and that, that was coffee. Are there any other common ways that you think we waste salt? Yeah. So one would be exercise. We actually lose a tremendous amount of salt and sweat. So the average person is going to lose between a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise through sweat. Um, And if it's like a very competitive uh, type of athletic event, like a soccer event in in the heat, you can lose up to 6,000 milligrams of sodium, which is an insane amount of salt. That's 15 grams of salt in just one hour. So we lose a ton through exercise. There's a bunch of disease states that can cause us to lose salt when we have damage to the intestines. That includes Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, celiac disease, IBS, um, diarrheal issues, things like that. And then there's there's a bunch of disease states that can damage the kidneys as well that cause us to lose salt. It sh- a high diet and sugar will damage the kidneys and can cause salt depletion. And there's a bunch of, besides exercise, a bunch of medications that cause us to lose salt. And like diuretics is the main cause of low sodium levels in the blood in the elderly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's a biggie because there, if you look at the prescription, like the shopping list that so many elderly are on, and the influence of all those drugs that potentially have in weight causing salt wasting, um, the antihypertensives or the high blood pressure pills can create salt wasting, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most common medications that is prescribed besides thiazide diuretics are loop diuretics 
and aldosterone antagonists. And we know aldosterone is one of our strongest mineral corticoids that allows us to reabsorb salt in the kidney. So people are being placed in all these medications that, that basically cause salt wasting, and then they're told to not eat salt. And then they're losing salt and caffeine and through sweat and through uh, low carb diets, which cause our insulin levels to drop and cause salt loss via the kidneys. And honestly, that's one of the one of the best things that people can take away from my book is initiating a ketogenic or low carb diet can be very difficult. And one of those one of the main uh, barriers is that um, Atkins flu and that is caused by salt depletion. Because when you drop your insulin levels, what happens is, is the kidneys have become so dependent on insulin to reabsorb salt that when you drop insulin, it just starts spilling insulin out the kidneys. So I kind of go over how much salt we need during the first and second week. But honestly, some people who have had insulin resistance for such a long time, their kidneys have become so dependent on insulin to reabsorb salt. They never can shut off fully salt loss out of their kidneys. And they're constantly getting dizzy episodes on low-carb diets. And they're not understanding. It's like you need more salt. So that's one of the best things that people can get out of my book. Yeah, I would fully agree. Um, I, I'm on a low carb way of eating. And I think back when I first started, I didn't even think about, I knew I needed some salt, but not to the level. Um, and especially again, because um, I was doing it more the the butter coffee route where I would have uh, butter in the coffee in the morning, you know, go with a bit of fasting and then go with the low carb meals in the day. So if I think about it, I, I would sort of feed my body with energy on the intermittent fasting with coffee and butter. But then I wasn't upping my salt intake plus I'm, I was going low carb and dumping so it's a I think that's a massive point in the low carb community that actually the amount of salt you need I think people are completely underestimating that amount yeah exactly they're so afraid of salt they're like counting the granules that they're putting on their food rather than just letting their body tell them how much they need yeah. it's crazy I mean, my I've been directly impacted by this because I've had two family members who were told to not salt their food and to go and basically what ended up happening is they were having these cravings for salt. And, and But the doctor just continually told them, do not salt your food. You should be on a low salt diet. They wound up in the hospital with low sodium levels in the blood and severe dehydration. It goes to show you that guidelines are not smarter than your own body. And for us to try to presume that that's the case is just insanity. So. Is there any useful way that someone could see if they're not getting enough salt? Because you give some tips in the book about urine testing and you can see your excretion levels. I mean, there's I love that case study you shared in the book about the guy who purposely depleted his sodium dramatically and how he was pulling and then to replenish himself. He was eating so much salt, but it just wasn't coming out his body because his body was just trying to replenish just to see that difference. So... Is there any way that we could sort of, uh, that someone at home would be able to sort of gauge, are they too low in salt? Is their body too low? Yeah, that's a great question. So we can kind of see it in two different ways. We can kind of branch it out into symptomatic symptoms of sodium depletion. And then on the lab, what may show up? So if you're having exercise intolerance, you're feeling dizzy, your, your heart rate's really elevated, you feel fatigued, or you feel fatigued when going from a seated to a standing position, you feel dizzy or lightheaded, that's a really good symptom that your body needs more salt. Um, there's also, if you, as you just described in the book, if you're eating a good amount of salt and barely anything is coming out in the urine, that generally means either one of two things. Either you're losing a lot of it in the, in the gastrointestinal system, and so you're you're basically not putting anything out in the urine or your body is so depleted, it's trying to hold on to everything. So if you're eating a normal salt diet and you're seeing very little come out in a 24 hour urinalysis, that's a good indication that you're depleted in salt. What's a quick kind of way to test for sodium depletion is if you're consuming a normal amount of water, like you're not restricting your water intake and you see that the BUN on a lab, which is blood urea nitrogen, that's a very common um, measurement. It's almost on every normal, typical lab work. If your BUN is elevated, that can also indicate salt depletion because what ends up happening is urea starts building up in the blood because there's such a low blood flow to the kidneys due to salt depletion. So that's one way on the lab that you could potentially you know, get after sodium depletion. So these are even things that maybe a patient could ask if they were concerned. They could go to the doctor and say, can we do a urinalysis? And yeah, 
And you could also do blood draws for sodium levels, or is or is that not even useful in this situation? No, I mean a hundred percent. Like low sodium levels in the blood, um, they're not always going to be indicative of total body sodium depletion. But what seems to happen in those people is salt restriction makes makes the situation worse. And in fact, what's a, what a lot of times has been confused with dilutional hyponatremia where we've constantly been blaming like athletes for over consuming water may actually be due to their low sodium intake because what ends up happening is the kidneys are much more sensitive to antidiuretic hormone when they when you consume a low salt diet meaning your kidneys don't get rid of as much water when you're on a low sodium diet causing the body to over retain water so we've blamed the over retention of water on either a disease state or on not or on over consuming water. And in fact, one of the main reasons could be not getting enough salt. And what ends up happening in athletes is they confuse salt hunger with thirst. So if you're not getting enough salt, you they, they over consume because they're not consuming enough salt, which is kind of crazy and a little counterintuitive. But it's it's one of those dogmas that and it's such a simple solution that I think a lot of athletes can benefit themselves by starting starting to integrate the salt they're losing through sweat, which there I've never seen a single sports drink have even close to the amount of salt that you lose in sweat that that you need to be consuming. So it's normally even the Gatorade or Powerade, they only have about 300 milligrams of sodium per liter and you sweat out about 1200 milligrams. So that goes to show you we're not even, we're not replacing what we're losing. Most people are just consuming tap water and and that's putting them at risk of low sodium levels in the blood. Hmm. So I, I wonder, I could see potentially then uh, in the athletics field, especially endurance runners, maybe marathon runners, that they get some sort of little salt supplement, like a salt tablet, and they draw, and it'd be better for them every X amount of time that they know, right, I'll probably after this amount of time, I've lost X amount of s- sodium. Let me pop a salt tablet in and jug some water versus trying to just get as much water during their marathon instead. That would be a much yeah. more efficient way. Absolutely. I mean... This was commonplace, like giving salt tablets to athletes back in the 60s, 70s was very commonplace. Like the British soccer team, when they did the World Cup in Mexico, they used slow releasing sodium tabs for their training and for their events. And because salt was demonized in the late 70s, everyone like most athletic teams went away from using salt supplements like that. And so I think we need to kind of get people back and say salt is an essential mineral and and start supplementing more of it because it's going to give you a lot of benefits and prevent heat stroke and all these other things that can happen when you lose too much salt and exercise. Mm. Yeah. Um, and even isn't with heat stroke, um, the problem is that you're you're losing a lot of fluid because of the permeability of your of your intestinal lining but and you've mentioned how salt is actually healthy for the intestinal lining too so i could imagine that if you actually had enough salt in your system that you could potentially mitigate some of the the risk of heat stroke i I could imagine yeah no it's funny because i kind of I have this love-hate relationship with Ansel Keys because we all know what he did back in the early 50s with the six-country study and then the seven-country study. But he did a really good study about exercising in the heat and working out in the heat. And he showed that actually consuming good amounts of salt lowers body temperature. And and one of the reasons is, is because salt increases blood circulation, it vasodilates the arteries so heat can escape better, and you can sweat more as well, which is our body's way of actually thermoregulating itself. So salt is your best way to actually cool your body down. And so when I when I learned that, that was pretty cool. And I was, I, I was sort of almost a fan of Ansel Keys at that point because I was like, oh, he actually brought this, this study out back in like, I think it was like the 1930s or 40s. And that was pretty cool that he did that study. Mm. Yeah, so I guess even there, the, um, hypothyroidism where people feel cold, um, one of the one of the the many f- ways of when they're trying to deal with that problem is again make sure you've got enough salt in your diet because naturally it will help you thermoregulate your body more efficiently. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, I, I just love it. That's why I said, you know, your book is amazing. Where if you just think about it, it's like, so why am I restricting salt? Again, one millimolar versus all of these other benefits is just insane, you know? So, absolutely. It is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, like I said, uh, the, the book is called The Salt Fix. Um, 
and I'm I'm using it as a reference guide for everyone saying, please, you know, if you've got a phobia about salt because you felt that you were going to die because you've sprinkled too much on your, your favorite food, <laughs> that trust me, you've come nowhere near causing yourself any harm by sprinkling that little bit extra. Um, as we found out, you could just end up your body's sufficient. It's just going to get rid of any excess salt if you've, if you have actually filled your silo. Um, but are there any other particular points you would like to maybe get across to any listeners, um, James, before we end? Yeah, sure. Um, so one point I wanted to make is the book actually has like a five step plan and it can help people with sugar addiction. So I published a lot on sugar addiction and salt is one of our best ways to help with sugar and refined carbohydrate addiction because salt depletion actually leads to an activation in the reward system in the brain. It's our defense mechanism that actually causes us to seek out salt and get a greater reward from it when we're depleted in salt. But the problem is, is things like sugar and, and processed foods can hijack that reward center on salt uh, when we're salt depleted. And so salt depletion can potentially lead to sugar and drug addiction. And I cover like ways of how to kind of prevent that in the book. So that's just something I definitely wanted to bring to your attention and also wanted to show um, your viewers the, this is the US cover of the salt fix. Oh, I know you the, have- Yeah, I've got the, the UK yeah. with the sprinkles of salt. You've got a salt shaker, do you? There's just one more question I actually should be asking because my wife wants me to ask you this. And it's um, about mothers who are breastfeeding. And is there any risk for them taking in too much salt? Got it. So risk for the child or risk for the mother? I guess ultimately everyone thinks, is there a risk for the child? Because if the mother's taking in too much salt, you know, and the baby's going to get salt through the breast milk. Got it. Yeah. Um, I've honestly never come across a study about how much salt comes out the breast milk. And if you over consume, could you get too much salt in the breast milk? And could that affect, um, you know, the child's health? I've never come across any study that says that. Honestly, because the body regulates salt intake, I don't ever see that really being an issue. Um, and, and honestly, one of the biggest issues is low salt intakes in pregnant women. And that was something I actually wanted to address as well. In the book, there was a study in over 2000 pregnant women that showed that low salt diets doubled miscarriages and tripled perinatal death and increased preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure and protein spilling in the urine. And it was fixed by a high salt intake. And part of that is because pregnancy is a low blood volume state because you're giving blood to your child, right? And so you need more salt. And that was like a myth. When I when I looked at that evidence and I saw that we bust, that there was never any evidence to indicate that people with um, high blood pressure while they're pregnant should cut their salt intake. And that in fact, the very disease state that we think is caused by too much salt, preeclampsia, can actually be treated by more salt. That just like blew my mind. So I, I definitely am happy we we came across, we brought that topic up. Yeah, because uh, that is always a big concern in pregnant women. It's like, oh no, I've got um, hypertension, I've got high blood pressure from the pregnancy. And then I, I can imagine all of them get told, right, let's implement low salt diets and other implement, um, other ways to try bring the blood pressure down, well, supposedly. But <laughs> again, it comes back to you. actually those women need salt. Yep, exactly. They need about, it seems like they need about twice the amount of a normal salt intake, sometimes even higher. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. So again, don't be scared that you're sprinkling with your fingertips. <laughs> you're coming yeah. nowhere near your actual body's need just and this is that's even that we're talking there about survival mechanism again we're not even talking about thriving so it's those right. levels of understanding yeah yeah well right. so james i just I, I just want to say thank you so much for that um you shared so many good points and there's and we didn't even probably cover all the points that this book goes through because there are i mean there's the, the point about cartilage cholesterol there's so many other such interesting points about salts and its uh, benefits um but I'm going to link to everything on the show notes and including the book, of course. But are there any other particular ways that you would like people to follow your work or to make contact with you? Yeah, I'm pretty active on Twitter. People can follow me at Dr. James Dinick, which is D-I-N-I-C. Um, they can go to my website, thesaltfix.com, if they want to purchase the book. There's about five different buttons they can click on to purchase the book. and um, Or they can, they can uh, friend me on Facebook. I'm pretty active in some of the low-carb ketogenic diet groups. Uh, helping people understand that they need more salt when they cut the carbs. 
Yeah. Well, what what you're going to find is I'm going to share this in the in the keto groups and the and the low carb groups, and I think we're going to get a nice discussion going about are you getting enough salt on your low carb diet? Yeah, that's that's the goal, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, so many golden points in this book. So again, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Thanks for having me, Gary. 